Okay, so you might notice we skipped a few chapters. We're now in chapter 13. We're looking at what electrons are doing. Uh, kind of big picture stuff is these next few chapters are all going to be geared towards trying to explain chemical bonding. And one of the things we're going to see is it turns out that electrons are the particles really responsible for how chem uh, chemicals bond the way that they do. And so that's where we're going to spend an entire chapter just looking at what the electrons are doing within these atoms. So we're going to look at the development of atomic models. We looked at a bit of this back in Chapter 5, uh, so for the most part I'm going to gloss over um, the real details here until we get to the new pieces. So again, uh, first atom uh, model we had that was a scientific model was Dalton's, and Dalton said the atom was considered to be a solid indestructible mass, kind of like a um, pool ball. And again, this uh, had this idea that atoms were indivisible. And again, just like a pool ball, so there's that. Next, we had the Thomson model. Uh, this was the electron, and uh, this gave us the plum pudding model of the atom. So again, what we had was this negatively charged electron scattered throughout positively charged. No one was really sure what the protons were doing in this case, which is one of the reasons this model did not have a lot of lasting power. Um, and again, just said that there were electrons floating around in this mass. Uh, plum pudding model, not, not too much more needed to be said. Uh, then came the Rutherford model. So this is where things start to get interesting. So Rutherford discovered the nucleus, so revised Thomson's model. So we now have uh, the electrons still negatively charged surrounding this small positively charged nucleus. And later experiments showed us that the nucleus was made up of protons and neutrons. And we'd see it kind of as a picture kind of like this. So we can see here in the center, uh, so in the center, there's our nucleus, lots of positive charges there. Uh, negatively charged electrons scattered around it. And that's kind of where we left off uh, back in Chapter 5. So now we're going to look at the Bohr model. So this was the next step and happened pretty shortly after the Rutherford model. So in 1913, uh, Niels Bohr, I believe he was Danish, but I could be wrong. 1913, Niels Bohr, who was actually a student of Rutherford's, uh, came up with a new atomic model. And what he did is he proposed that electrons are arranged in circular paths or orbits around the nucleus. Uh, this is often called the planetary model. It was based off of the idea of the planets where um, instead of the sun being at the center of the solar system and the planets rotating uh, around that, you have the nucleus and the electrons kind of rotating around that. Um, one of the concerns with this is if the electrons are just kind of there <coughs> and on these paths, uh, why don't they just fall into the nucleus? So he kind of did some, well, there's a substantial amount of math behind this right now, but you don't need to worry about that. Um, but said that electrons within that fixed path have a fixed amount of energy. So if they fell into the nucleus, they would lose the energy, but they can't, so they don't. So I don't have to worry too much about that. Now, this next term is vitally important, energy level. The energy level of an electron is a region around the nucleus where the electron is likely to be moving. Um, the biggest misconception with this is thinking that energy levels are an amount of energy. No. Energy levels are a location. Think of it like uh, floors of a building could be considered an energy level. But again, as long as you kind of remember that energy levels are a location, and just to make this confusing, each location does have a certain amount of energy associated with it, but the energy level itself is describing a location, not an amount. So here is a uh, not-to-scale illustration of the Bohr model of the atom. And again, this is, I think, what most people think of when they think of what an atom looks like. So you have the nucleus there in the center. You have electrons are in the orbits. Uh, sometimes you see this picture of the Bohr model of the atom. And again, I think this is kind of the standard model that most people think of. Uh, sometimes these rings are going out at kind of wonky angles to make it look all fancy. But wonky angles or not, this is the Bohr model. Uh, it's really easy to work with, uh, which is why it's what you've probably learned or probably seen. Um, un unfortunately, it's, it's wrong. But before we get into why the Bohr model is wrong, let's talk energy levels. Because 
Energy levels are one of the really key pieces of the Bohr model that extends forward. So one common analogy when talking about energy levels uh, of the electrons or the atom is think about rungs of a ladder. Now you can climb up or down a ladder, just like electrons can actually move up or down between different energy levels. Uh, the lowest rung closest to the Earth would be like the lowest energy level, so the lowest energy level would be the one closest to the nucleus. And a person can climb up or down by going rung to rung. The idea behind this is you can't really hang out between the rungs. Similarly, electrons can move from one energy level to the other, but you, again, you can't hang out between the rungs. An electron will not be found between the energy levels. The electron is where, uh, or the energy levels are where the electrons are. And again, it's that region of space where we can find them. So we don't find electrons between the energy levels. Now it's interesting, and again, think of this like the rungs of a ladder. To move from one energy level to the next, an electron must gain or lose just the right amount of energy. Just like if you're climbing a ladder, your foot has to move up just the right amount. If your foot is even an inch below the rung of the ladder, you're not going to be able to climb up. Um, if you put your foot above the rung of the ladder and try to press down, you're not going anywhere. It's only when your foot has moved exactly the right distance can you climb the ladder. Likewise with these electrons, that they have to gain or lose just enough energy to kind of move from energy level to energy level. We call this amount of energy needed to move from one energy level to another a quantum of energy. Uh, and if you want to sound really smart, find ways to work the word quantum into your kind of general uh, vocabulary. Um, unfortunately, most people, when they think of the word quantum, if they think of it at all, um, use the term badly. Um, when we talk about quantum, it's really just that this these energy amounts from one energy level to the next, the amount of energy needed to move, comes in set amounts. So we say elect, uh, energies of electrons are said to be quantized. Um, and if you hear the word quanta, it's simply just the plural of quantum. But again, the idea behind here is that it's set amounts, nothing in between. Just like the rungs of a ladder, the distance between those are really quantized. There's no rungs between rungs, if that makes sense. There's no locations for electrons to be between the energy levels. And again, since each energy level has an energy associated with it, um, we say that those energies are quantized. Now, just to make life a little bit confusing, is it turns out the amount of energy gained or lost by an electron uh, moving from one energy level to the next is not always the same when going to different energy levels. Um, so again, unlike a ladder where the energy level, where the rungs are evenly spaced, the energy levels aren't. Uh, generally what we find is the farther from the nucleus you go, uh, the closer they become. So if, here's kind of an example. So ground state, think of this as kind of where, where we're starting. We can move from the ground state to this excited state here. This would be another energy level. So I think it's like first energy level, second energy level, so on and so forth. So it takes a quantum of, ener of energy to move from the first to the second. It would take another quantum of energy, a different quantum of energy, uh, to move from the second to the third, or the third to the fourth, so on and so forth. But notice that they start to get compressed. The amount of energy needed to move from one to the next starts to get smaller and smaller. Very, very common to see there. But again, these are still quantized because there's no in-between. You can't have an electron just like hanging out here. It's, it's, can't be. It can be at uh, energy level one. It could be at energy level two, energy level three. But nothing just hanging out in the middle doesn't work. So we're now going to look at the uh, kind of modern model of the atom, uh, which is called the quantum mechanical model of the atom. So uh, this came about in 1926, an Austrian physicist by the name of Erwin Schrödinger. 
Um, and some of you, especially the more geeky amongst you, may recognize the term Schrodinger or the name Schrodinger uh, from something called Schrodinger's cat. I'm not going to get into what that means, but yes, that is that same Schrodinger. Um, anyway, so he used this new idea of quantum theory, and quantum theory really just saying, again, that the energies of electrons are quantized. That means that they come in small set amounts with, with nothing in between. And he wrote, um, basically, and solved a mathematical equation that allowed him to describe, in other words, to find the location and energy of an electron in a hydrogen atom. Note, he started with a hydrogen atom because, the, because it only has one electron. It's the simplest form of matter. Um, now, where this differs is all previous models to the quantum mechanical model uh, were based on uh, the physics of large objects. So we kind of went with what we knew of how objects like us move around the world, and we assumed that electrons did the same. Um, the quantum mechanical model, however, is based primarily upon relatively advanced mathematics. Uh, and for those of you who are wondering, here is a very blurry image of the Schrodinger equation. Uh, I'm just showing you this just to show it to you. Uh, you don't have to solve this. Um, and you will not have to solve it unless you become a chemistry or a physics major. Uh, as a chemistry major, you would solve this somewhere around your senior year in college. Uh, and by then you have the multivariable calculus to kind of back this up. And it's not terrible once you know what you're doing. It just looks really scary uh, right now. So, like the Bohr model... Uh, the quantum mechanical model still has energy levels. So that's one of the really big things that we're taking away from the Bohr models. We're keeping this idea of energy levels that electrons are restricted to these locations. But we're moving away from this idea that these energy levels are pathways. The quantum mechanical model doesn't support this. The quantum mechanical model uh, does something a little bit differently. Uh, instead, what the quantum mechanical model does is it says that there is a region in space in which there is a high probability of finding an electron. And that's the most of what we can say because the Schrodinger equation is based off of probability and statistics. So we can't say for certain there's an electron right here. There. It's there. No, it's there's a region in space in which there is a high probability of finding an electron. And so we can now view uh, the atom as kind of a, a fuzzy cloud. That you would have a nucleus in the center, so you kind of have a nucleus, and you'd have this area of probability around the nucleus in which we can find the electron. Uh, where it's densest is where we have the greatest probability of finding it. And so like with a hydrogen atom, so this picture on the screen, this is now what our atoms look like. Uh, it's a little unsatisfying, I'm aware. And what this is saying is this cloud, because again, it's all based on probability, this cloud represents where the electron would be about 90% of the time. Now I know a common question that gets asked at this juncture is, well, where is it the other 10% of the time? And the answer is an unsatisfying somewhere else. Again, it's a consequence of this coming from probability and statistics. So, just like in the Bohr model, just to remind you, we are still using energy levels. And we call energy levels the principal, principal quantum number, and they're really the same thing. It's, kind of, it's like saying the first floor of a building is floor number one. This is saying the first energy level has a principal quantum number of one. The second energy level has a principal quantum number of two. So again, each principal quantum number refers to the energy level. So again, these two terms really are interchangeable. And these are assigned in order of increasing energy uh, and also distance from the nu increasing distance from the nucleus. So the first energy level is the lowest energy and it's the one closest to the nucleus. The second energy level has the next highest amount of energy and it would be the next closest to the nucleus. And these are always whole numbers because again, we don't have fractions. There's no, there's no in between. 
Uh, and again, as we get to higher energy levels, we get farther and farther from the nucleus. Now this is where it gets a little bit funky. Uh, within each energy level, there are sublevels that make it up. So you can think of this like a few, uh, with a few different analogies. So think about like energy levels in the building. So you have a building, that's our atom. And you have floors on that building or in that building. Each floor would be like an energy level. Within each floor, you might have various rooms. The rooms would be like the sublevels. Another example is uh, like rows and sections in a stadium. You might be in section one and there's rows built into that. Now the rule is there will be a number of energy sublevels equal to whatever its energy level is. So working with our building analogy, it's going to be a very weird building. Uh, on the first floor of the building, that's like the first energy level, it only has one room because the first energy level only has one sublevel. The second floor of the building would have two rooms in it because the second energy level is made up of two sublevels. Let's say that we get to the third floor. Third floor is made of three rooms. Third energy level, three uh, sublevels. Uh, energy level four, four sublevels. So fourth floor of the building would be made up of four rooms. Now in all of this sublevels and energy levels, where are the electrons? So again, there's no set orbit anymore. Instead, we have these regions of probability of finding an electron. We call these regions orbitals. Orbitals. And not orbits anymore, orbitals. And these orbitals are what make up the sublevels. And we'll see that gets a little bit more complex in a moment. Uh, now, orbitals are designated by letters. There's different types of orbitals. Each orbital type has a different letter associated with it. And um, also, they come in different set amounts. So one uh, sublevel type comes in sets of one. It's just one, one orbital hanging out by itself. One orbital type comes in sets of three. So if we have that sort of orbital, there's three of them. And we'll see how this looks coming up. So these shapes of orbitals. So the simplest type of orbital, and we're going to kind of go in order because there is an order to these. Uh, the first sort of orbital that we have is called an S orbital, and they are spherically shaped. So here's kind of a picture of what that would look like. So if you had an S orbital, so like that uh, diagram I showed you earlier of the fuzzy cloud shaped kind of like a sphere, that would have represented an S orbital. Uh, next are P orbitals. P orbitals are kind of barbell shaped or like like a figure eight uh, and they come in sets of three. So again, you can see one, two, and three. Uh, and the way that those are lined up is that uh, you have those two spheres, one lined up along the x-axis uh, kind of horizontally, one aligned with the y-axis vertically and one aligned with the z-axis, uh, kind of giving us three dimensions. You need to know the shapes of S and P orbitals. Okay. Next comes the D orbitals. D orbitals come in sets of five. And now the shapes start to get a little weirder. Most of the D orbitals look kind of like X's arranged around various axes except for one of them looks like a uh, P orbital with a donut around its middle. So I don't need you to worry about those shapes, but you do need to know the number. So if you have D orbitals, they always come in sets of five. And finally, F orbitals uh, come in sets of seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And again, very even weirder shapes. You don't need to know those. Now, some people wonder, where do these shapes come from? How do we see this? These shapes are the consequence of solving the Schrodinger equation. When you solve the Schrodinger equation for where electrons can be, these shapes, these three-dimensional shapes, are actually the output of the Schrodinger equation. And again, should you become a chemistry major somewhere around your senior year in college, you'll take a class called physical chemistry, in which case you'll solve the Schrodinger equation and you'll see these shapes coming out. But again, that's a bit above the pay grade of high school chemistry students. 
So now we're going to look at kind of where this all comes together. So this statement here, the shapes of atomic orbitals depend on the energy sublevel, a little bit misleading. Let's see what this really means. So in the first energy level, because as quantum number one has one sublevel, we call that one sublevel 1s. The one tells us that it's in the first energy level. The s tells us what type of orbitals make it up. Because it's S, it means it's made from S-type orbitals. And what do S-type orbitals come in sets of? They come in sets of one that are shaped like a sphere. Now, when we get to the second energy level, it's made up of two sublevels, the 2S and the 2P. So let's kind of break this down back to kind of our building. So if, um, if our building is an atom this way, in the first floor it would be made of a one room, and that one room would be called 1S. Um, and there's just one, one place for people to sit. There'd be like one, one chair, one place we could find people, one, let's say one table. Um, and we'll say the table is uh, kind of make, is the orbitals. And the second energy level, so the second floor, there's two rooms. One room is labeled 2S, one room is labeled 2p. Now again, think about what the numbers mean. The 2 in 2s and 2p tells me which energy level it's part of. The letter tells me what sort of orbitals we're dealing with. So, in the room labeled 2s, again, s orbitals come in sets of 1. In the room labeled 2s, there would be one table, one place we would find people. In the 2p, however, so p orbitals come in sets of three. So in the 2p room, there'd be three tables that we could find people. So there. So we're gonna keep going. So now we're gonna talk, uh, let's say third floor, third energy level. So the third energy level has three sublevels, 3s, 3p, and 3d. Again, the number is telling us the energy level it's in. The letter is telling us the orbital type. So again, breaking this down to our building. On the third floor, there'd be three rooms, one labeled 3s, one labeled 3p, one labeled 3d. In the 3s room, there'd be one table. The 3p room, there'd be three tables. And the 3d room, there'd be five tables. And then we finally get to the fourth energy level, the fourth floor. Uh, so there'd be four rooms, the 4s, the 4p, the 4d, and the 4f. The 4s room would be made up, would have one table, the 4p would have three, the 4d would have five, and the 4f would have seven. So those are different locations in which um, orbitals can be found. Now, you can tie all of this together and say at the maximum number of electrons that can occupy any energy level, not sublevel, but an energy level is given by the formula 2n squared n being the energy level number or the principal quantum number. So if we're in energy level 2, let's say, so if I do 2 squared, that's 4, times 2 is 8. Now again, where does this come from? It turns out that each orbital can hold two electrons. And we'll learn more about this coming up. Each orbital can hold two electrons. So in the second energy level, you have the 2s and the 2p. The 2s consists of one orbital. The 2p consists of three orbitals. Um, and again, each orbital can hold two electrons. So we have four, electron, uh, four orbitals total for a grand total of eight possible electrons in the second energy level. So we're going to look at section 13.2. This is looking at what's called electron configurations. And electron configurations are really saying this is where the electrons are. So now that we have all these energy levels, sublevels, orbitals, uh, again, the question still remains, where are the electrons? And the electron configuration tells us where the electrons are. So it'll tell us which sublevels have electrons in them, how many electrons are in those sublevels. Uh, kind of, this brings everything together. Now, the idea behind this is this rule that I, it, it creeps up throughout all of science and um, 
I call it the nature is lazy law. And it uh, really says that in all natural phenomena, means the things that occur naturally, change, per change proceeds towards the lowest possible energy state. In other words, things happen naturally so that it gets us in the lowest amount of energy. And the idea behind this is that high energy systems are unstable. And if they're unstable, they will change to become more stable. And more stability means lowest energy. Now, in the atom, electrons in the nucleus interact with each other in ways to give us the most stable arrangement possible. Because what's happening is the electrons are attracted to the nucleus but repelled by each other. And so they eventually kind of sort out into a system where everything is the most stable. And that's the lowest energy possible. And we call that lowest energy arrangement of all the electrons, the electron configuration. Now to help us out with this, there are three rules that we are going to use simultaneously to find the electron configuration. And as we go through these, I'm going to introduce them one by one. Um, but they work together really well. Uh, the three rules are called the Aufbau Principle. I love saying the word Aufbau, Aufbau. Anyway, uh, the Aufbau Principle, the Pauli Exclusion Principle, and Hun's Rule. So, what does the Aufbau Principle tell us? The Aufbau Principle, at its heart, just tells us electrons enter orbitals of lowest energy first. And again, that should be no great surprise that we want to be in the lowest energy configuration, so electrons are going to go where they'd have the lowest energy. Um, now, the kind of sub-bullets here, we'll address these one by one. So the various orbitals within a sub-level of a principal energy level are always of equal energy. What this means is if you have uh, a sub-level like 2p, which has three orbitals in it, those three orbitals in the 2p sub-level all have equal energy. So if you have uh, orbitals within a sub-level, they're all equal energy. Uh, S sublevels will always be the lowest energy sublevel for an energy level. And what we're going to see as we proceed with this is they can actually start overlapping, especially uh, once we get to higher energy levels. So as we get to higher energy levels, the kind of high end of uh, one energy level may overlap with the low end of another. Luckily, you don't have to remember all those little weird overlaps because you're going to see you have a tool that will help you do this. So this is the tool that we're going to use. And you have one of these uh, in your notebook. And you'd be given one of these on the opportunity. Very, very handy. Um, so this is not complete. There's a much more complete one in your textbook. Um, but this one will work for our purposes today. And we're going to see how we can use this tool to tell us where electrons are. Now, the general convention is we represent electrons as arrows, either pointing up or arrows pointing down. Um, now, as a note, when I do this, when I'm drawing these myself, I've always seen it as these little half arrows. Um, that's just the way I was taught it. When you see it, me doing this on here, I actually was able to um, print out an arrow through a font, so you'll see a full arrow pointing up or down. You can do a full arrow, you can do a half arrow, really doesn't matter. So... Uh, we're going to look at the situation here. And what the Aufbau principle tells us is we always fill electrons starting from the bottom. Uh, I think I have this on a later slide. It's like filling up a cup of water. You have to fill up the bottom before you can fill up the top. So we ask ourselves, if we're going to start filling electrons, which sublevel has the lowest amount of energy? Well, that would be the one at the bottom. So that would be the 1s. When the 1s is filled, we could fill the 2s. When the 2s is filled, we could fill the 2ps, then the 3s, then the 3ps, then the 4s, then the 3ds, then the 4ps. We just keep going up, fill from the bottom to the top. And we have to fill up a sublevel before we can move on to the next one. So, what are we looking at here? So, this would represent an atom with one electron. So, this would be like hydrogen. So we can see there's one uh, electron, goes in the 1s. Uh, notice I have my arrow pointed up. This arrow could be pointed down. That would be just as correct. Um, I would choose, just to make your life simple, a default. Will your first arrow in a box be up or down? And just be consistent about it. Me, by default, I always do up. You don't have to, though. 
And again, I like to think of it like filling up a cup. So the next one is the Pauli exclusion principle. And what this tells us, and we talked a little bit about this in the previous section, is that any orbital can hold at most two electrons. But what the Pauli exclusion principle tells us is that to do so, to have two electrons in the same orbital, the two electrons must have uh, opposite spins. Well, what is spin, you may ask? Spin is a property that electrons have. Uh, spin can either be clockwise or counterclockwise. We would represent that with an up arrow or a down arrow, um, completely arbitrary, which is which. And all it really says is that um, when, uh, because an electron has spin, is that it acts as if it is spinning. Um, and what this means is that when you have something with a charge, like an electron, and it spins, it creates a magnetic field. And that's what we see electrons doing. We see electrons creating this magnetic field as they spin. We don't actually know if they're spinning, which is why we're not saying they are spinning. We are saying they act as if they're spinning. So what this means now is that if I have an orbital containing two electrons uh, in that one orbital, we'd have one arrow pointed up, one arrow pointed down, and once it has those two electrons in it, that is a filled orbital. So back to our little diagram here. So if an atom had three electrons in it, the first electron would go in the 1s. Uh, notice I did this as up first. I always do up first. You could do down first. doesn't really matter. So the first electron goes there. Second electron goes in the 1s, opposite spin of the first. So now the 1s has two electrons in it. Since it has two electrons in it, the 1s is filled. So the third electron will go in the next highest sublevel, which is the 2s. And again, notice I put that up. Again, by default, I will always put my first arrow in any orbital, uh, which is what each box represents, uh, pointing up. And I'll always do my second one pointing down. You don't have to do it that way, but choose, choose something and be consistent about it. And this leads us to our final rule, Hund's rule. Uh, when electrons occupy orbitals of equal energy, so think of orbitals of equal energy. So those would be like uh, the set of three orbitals that make up the 2p sublevel. One electron was going to go into each orbital until all of the orbitals contained one electron with spins parallel. Um, I call this the don't be the creepy guy on the bus rule. So think about a bus. If you get on a bus and there's very few seats taken, there's like, let's say, two people on the bus, each of them sitting by themselves. You get on there, you don't know anyone. Chances are, if you don't want to be the creepy guy on the bus, you're going to find an empty seat and sit there. And as people fill up the bus, they're going to keep finding empty seats, sitting alone. Only when all the seats um, have someone in them will people start doubling up uh, on the seats. That's what Hun's rule is. So we're back to our old diagram. So we've already seen the three electrons, so they go like this. Uh, if there's four electrons, the next one would go in the 2s. And then for the next three, they'd go in the 2p. So here'd be electron 5, 6, and 7. Um, now notice I did that 5, 6, and 7 going from left to right. You don't have to. You could do like 5, 6, and 7. Uh, perfectly acceptable. But don't get fancy with this. Your life is hard enough as it is without making up new weird rules just to be strange. Uh, that meets no other purpose. So go left to right or right to left. Pick something and go with it. But notice that I have put one electron in each of the 2p orbitals. Now that they each have one, I can start doubling up. So if I have eight electrons, the last one goes into one of the 2p orbitals um, facing down. Now as a note, I put it into the one on the left. I didn't have to. I could have put that uh, eighth one uh, anywhere I wanted in, in, within the 2p. Again, I always go left to right. I always go first arrows up. It's just how I do it. Now that we know where the electrons are, we need to know how we communicate this. So when you're writing out an electron configuration, you simply just write down every sublevel that has an electron in it. And then as a superscript, you would write down how many electrons are there. 
And again, remember each sublevel can only hold so many electrons. So that's superscript. So if you have a something s like a 1s or a 2s, it can only hold two electrons. If you have a 2p sublevel, it can hold at most six electrons as its superscript. So that's kind of a way just to check yourself to make sure you're on the right track with this. So a few examples. So hydrogen. So we fill in the chart. We saw hydrogen with one electron. Uh, so looking at the sheet, I'm going to put in the 1s. So hydrogen's electron configurations would be 1s1. And that's how we would say it, 1s1, not 1s to the first. This is not a math equation. I can't just write s because we never put the coefficient and we don't do the power to the first. No, 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 no. It's 1s1. Uh, carbon. So we look at carbon. Carbon has six electrons. So when I start filling out that table, I would uh, put two into the 1s, two into the 2s, two into the 2p. In a way that you can always check yourself uh, is add up all your subscripts, and they should add up to the number of electrons present. Uh, sulfur has 16 electrons, so you'd see something like this. We'd say it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4. So again, that's telling me that there's two electrons in the 1s, two electrons in the 2s, six electrons in the 2p, two electrons in the 3s, and four electrons in the 3p. And again, just to remind you, so how do we know how many electrons an atom has? If we're talking a neutral atom, the number of electrons is going to be equal to our number of protons. Now, uh, writing abbreviated electron configurations. This is not in your textbook uh, and also not required, but I'm showing this to you because it's helpful for some people. Uh, basically, we can base everything off of the noble gases. Noble gases have filled sublevels. We'll talk more about what that means later on. So, for example, neon has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That's what neon is. So, what I can do is I can abbreviate an electron configuration by substituting the noble gas in for what its electron configuration is. Let me tell you what I'm, um, what that means. Now, as a note, when I say previous to the element we're looking for, so you find the element on the periodic table and you look at the noble gas that comes to the left of it or above it, because that's the way it's going to work. Uh, always the noble gas that comes prior to the element that we're concerned with. So here's an example. So carbon has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. The noble gas prior to carbon is helium. So helium has an electron configuration of 1s2. So what I can do is I can substitute out the 1s2 in carbon's electron configuration with helium. So I can write helium in brackets 2s2, 2p2. Doesn't really save us much time when we're doing something that replaces helium. Uh, but look at sulfur. So here's sulfur's electron configuration. We saw that earlier. Neon is the noble gas that comes before it. Neon has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And so what I can do is I can substitute this whole chunk here, because that's what uh, neon is, with just saying neon 3s2, 3p4. Completely optional at this point. If, when I ask for an electron configuration, if you do the full one, perfectly fine. If you do the abbreviated, perfectly fine. A brief warning. 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 Does this mean you could express neon as NE? No. Again, you have to use the element, that, the noble gas that comes prior to it. So neon, you could use helium to abbreviate it. But again, using helium to abbreviate stuff, really not useful. Now, what about ions? So remember, ions are atoms that have gained or lost electrons. We can do an electron configuration of an ion. We just have to change the number of electrons. So for example, sodium ion. So if I have a sodium ion, normal sodium is this, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Um, when atoms lose electrons, they always lose their highest energy electrons first. So which ones would go first? Well, that would be the 3s1. So since sodium has lost one electron, its electron configuration would just be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. 
Um, you could do this by either just removing it from the base or looking at the periodic table going, okay, sodium has 11 electrons, sodium ion being a plus one charge only has 10, and then fill out your chart with only 10 electrons works either way. Uh, valence configurations. We're going to talk more about this later. Uh, only reason I'm covering it now is we're going to play a game, electron configuration bingo, and we need the valence configurations. So the valence electrons are the electrons used in bonding. Very important coming up. The valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost energy level. Now I want to stress something. The outermost energy level, not the outermost energy sublevel. So we'll see what that means in a moment. So here is nitrogen's electron configuration. So what's the highest energy level in nitrogen? It's not 2p, 2p. 2p is a sublevel. 2s is a sublevel. The highest energy level is 2. So everything in that second energy level would be the valence electrons. So if nitrogen has an electron configuration of uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p3, its valence configuration would just be what's in its highest energy level, so 2s2, 2p3. So you only list the sublevels in the highest energy level when you're doing a valence configuration. So transition metals are weird. We know that transition metals are weird. Transition metals break the rules. They continue to, or they break the rules because they get weird electron configurations. So oftentimes with the transition metals, we get like half-filled sublevels, we get stuff that's skipped, we get weird stuff happening. Do we have to worry about that? No, you do not. So don't worry about it. Just be aware that the transition metals uh, have weird configurations. Okay, and we're now in the last section of the chapter. So we're going to kind of go backwards. We're going to look at physics and the quantum mechanical model. Um, it's all going to be related, trust me. So our first idea of what light was came from Newton, thought that light was a particle. Uh, in the early 1900s, scientists viewed light as a wave, so Newton thought light kind of as like matter. Uh, scientists later said light was a wave, it's energy. Um, and the energy type that we would view it as is called an electromagnetic wave. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Interesting note, uh, we now say they're both right. It's, it's both. Both are correct. But light, it can be treated as an electromagnetic wave. Uh, electromagnetic waves are a class of energy waves, radio waves, uh, microwaves, visible light, infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. All of these are ultraviolet, or sorry, all are electromagnetic waves. Uh, and uh, light is just part of that. Now, what you do need to know is that all electromagnetic waves, regardless of its type, move through a vacuum at a speed of 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Uh, that speed is called the speed of light. Uh, but it could is just as easily be called the speed of microwave or the speed of ultraviolet. Uh, we call it the speed of light because we knew about light first because we can see it. So properties of waves. Um, think about waves looking kind of like a sine or a cosine function. They start at a point, they go down or up, and then back to where they started. Uh, the amplitude of the wave, and I'm going to have a picture of this on the next slide. The amplitude of the wave is the height of the wave from the middle to the highest or middle to the lowest, not top to bottom. It's middle to the top, middle to the bottom. Uh, the highest part is called a crest. The lowest part is called the trough. You have the wavelength, which uh, abbreviated as lambda, is the distance between the crests measured in meters. So it's the length of the wave. And then you also have the frequency variable looks like a V. It's actually the Greek letter nu is how, however many wave cycles pass a given point in a unit of time. So if you're standing in one spot and three waves pass by you every second, we would say it has a frequency of three waves per second. So here is kind of the slide. So we see amplitude. So notice amplitude here is going from the middle to the highest. Amplitude could also go from the middle to the lowest. That would also be the amplitude. Uh, wavelength, again, is from one part of the wave from the, of the other. So here is crest to crest. We see that up top. We could also go from like here to here. Those would be the same length. Uh, that's still one wavelength. Um, frequency you can't really see in a graph. Now, very important phrase. I want you to remember this. Frequency and wavelength are what we say 
are inversely related. And what inversely related means is as one goes up, the other goes down. They're related to each other by this equation here. You will need to know this. This is your frequency, nu. C is the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8th. Lambda here is your wavelength. So in a problem, you might be given wavelength, asked to solve for frequency. You could be given frequency, asked to solve for wavelength. Notice you're not going to be given speed of light in a lot of these problems because the speed of light is a constant, 3 times 10 to the 8th. Um, so yeah. So sunlight. Uh, sunlight, also called white light, consists of light with a continuous range of wavelengths and frequencies. When you pass sunlight through a prism, you get what's called a spectrum, also known as a rainbow. And we get that red, orange, yellow, um, green, blue, indigo, violet. Indigo sometimes left off. Um, you know that as Roy G. Biv is the common mnemonic that you probably see. So Roy G. Biv. So you spell that out. Uh, anyway. So we can see here, so this is kind of a full picture of an electromagnetic spectrum, full range. And you can see the visible light here is just this tiny little portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, the only thing that, <coughs> excuse me, the only thing that differentiates visible light from any of the other types of electromagnetic waves is we can see it. We just have sensory organs that are tuned to it. That, that's it. Um... But again, so we see these colors here. So red, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet as we go across. Now at this point, I know what you're wondering. What the heck does this have to do with chemistry? Well, every element emits light when you heat it up. Think about like a burner on a stove. It's kind of a gray, uh, grayish black. You turn the burner on to high, it turns red. And what's happening here is this actually is explained by electrons. The colors that we see are because of electrons. Because what happens is, as something is heated up or it just absorbs energy, the electrons start off in their ground state. That's the normal electron configuration. They gain certain amounts of energy. So they jump up to higher energy levels. They call it the excited state. But the excited state is unstable. So they're going to fall back to the ground state. But as they do so, because energy doesn't just vanish, they emit uh, energy in the form of an electromagnetic wave. And if it's the right amount of energy, we can see it as visible light. Otherwise, it's just some other form of electromagnetic wave. Now, this is how we see everything. So if I help look at like a green pen, it looks green because the green pen is absorbing energy in the form of light from the just the light around me. And it turns out that there's a chemical in the green pen called a pigment. And it's absorbing energy. The electrons are jumping up a specific uh, to a specific energy level. They're falling back down. As they fall back down, they emit light of a specific energy, and we see that specific amount of energy uh, as green. Now, if you take a sample of sunlight, or an element, sorry, and you've heated up and it's glowing and you pass that through a prism, you get what's called the atomic emission spectrum. And they're different than white light. Because instead of a full rainbow, you get specific lines of color. And each line of color comes about from an electron jumping up and falling back down a specific amount of energy. So here is examples of different atomic spectrum of elements. So we can see here, let's look at hydrogen. So we can see one line here, 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 and here. Each of those lines have a specific amount of energy and a wavelength and a frequency associated with them. Um, and so we see them as specific colors. Each one comes from the one electron in hydrogen jumping up to a higher energy level, falling back down, and emitting a specific color as it goes. And what's interesting is the emission spectra is unique for each element. Each element has different electron structures. 
uh, and it actually acts kind of like the fingerprint of an element. We can actually use these atomic emission spectrum to identify, uh, here I say, inaccessible or unknown substances. This is how we know what faraway stars are made from. As we look at the light coming from it, we analyze it, and we can look at the spectrum of the... So, um, after seeing these emission spectrums for all these different gases, people want to know why there were these discrete lines. Classical physics couldn't explain it. Classical physics would predict this continuous change in energy, not these set levels. And a German physicist by the name of Max Planck tried to describe why an object changes color when it's heated. So, for instance, if you have a piece of iron, it starts black. You heat it up a little bit, it turns red. Heat up more, it turns yellow. Heat up more, it turns white, then blue. Um, at really specific temperatures. And blacksmiths know this. This is how they know when uh, their iron has reached the right, right temperature to work with. And because he was seeing these specific color changes at specific temperatures, he said, okay, the, the, we're saying that energy, because he knew there was a linkage between energy and temperature, that these color changes could only occur that because energy changes happened in small set amounts. And this should sound familiar. Small set amounts of energy is the idea of the quantum. It's the idea of the energy level. This is actually where the idea of quantized energy came from. So what Planck then did is he offered a mathematical equation relating the amount of energy to the frequency, which is this equation here, which you need to know. And uh, h there is Planck's constant. We can see the value there. And what Planck says is any attempt to change energy by a fraction of this h nu will fail. There is no fraction. There is no in-between. Just like there is no in-between energies of the energy levels. It comes in small set amounts. Small set amounts. This is the where quantized energy started.